Hi, uh, good day. Uh, I am Layok and welcome to webinar one, Water Management and Treatment. So today's webinar is the first of the webinar series on experience sharing on water and wastewater management and treatment between Singapore and Sri Lanka, which is jointly organized by the NUS Environmental Research Institute, in short, NARI, at National University of Singapore with the Joint Research and Demonstration Center for Water Technology, that is JRDC, uh, under the Ministry of Water Supply and University of uh, Peridinia, Sri Lanka, together with PUB, Singapore's National Water Agency, as the supporting organization. Um, without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Hao Yong Ng, Director of NARI, NUS, to give his opening remark. Professor Ng? Hi, good day, greeting to everybody. On behalf of NUS Environmental Research Institute, we are delighted to have this opportunity to jointly organize the webinar series on experience sharing on water and wastewater management and treatment between Singapore and Sri Lanka with the Joint Research and Demonstration Center for Water Technology or JRDC in short, Ministry of Water Supply and University of Paradinia, Sri Lanka together with PUB, the Singapore National Water Agency as a supporting organization. Climate change has brought about many pressing challenges affecting our water security and water mm -hmm. quality. Among these, we have been experiencing more frequent and intense unpredictable weather events, such as drought, intense precipitation, high variation in ambient temperature, and so forth. All key stakeholders, including the water authorities, regulators, practitioners, and researchers, have critical roles to ensure our precious resource water is managed sustain sustainably in this climate change era for our daily needs and for the long-term development of our countries. Through this webinar series, the knowledge and experience shared would help foster our understanding on the emerging challenges and learning from each other on the potential management and treatment strategies to address these climate crisis challenges. It gives great pleasure to welcome all of you to today's inaugural event on the topic, Water Management and Treatment, to mark the beginning of our webinar series. I'm very honored to have prominent speakers from the water agencies, academia, and industries from Sri Lanka and Singapore. I wish you have a fruitful session. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Professor Ng. Next, I would like to invite Dr. S.K. Baragoda, Director, covering up the uh, for Joint Research and Demonstration Center for Water Technology, uh, JRDC, um, Sri Lanka, to deliver his opening speech. Yes, Dr. Baragoda, please. Thank you very much for organizing this uh, very special webinar series, uh, bringing up a uh, lot of opportunities for us to share the experiences in water management and treatment uh, between Sri Lanka and Singapore. So Singapore, we all know that uh, you are doing very well in the world in regards of, uh, especially the NRW putting up at the lowest figures, that is 5%. Uh, so we are going around 25% right now. So as a country, we like uh, 65,000 square kilometers and having a population of 21 million. So this is sort of uh, like a very good uh, sort of way forward for us to understand how you have reached to this all wonderful figures. So when it's coming to Sri Lankan water management, the government policy has been derived to focus around water for all. So that's a like a sort of challenge that Sri Lanka right now facing. So all the good practices, experiences would be very much beneficial for the water professionals in Sri Lanka. The idea here in uh, China, uh, Sri Lanka Joint Research and Demonstration Center for Water Technology, this is funded by the government of China. It's got about uh, 15 million uh, US dollars and Sri Lankan government has um, awarded about 8 million US dollars. So altogether, we got a facility of almost uh, uh, in uh, Sri Lankan rupees, I would call about 
600 million worth that means almost like 2.5 million us dollars worth facility for testing we got all the high end equipment available with us now so that's a very good way forward and we are located in university of peradeniya one of the best universities in this, this region and uh, we are supported we are back with the expertise coming from university of peradeniya so this is what the 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 blessing the the capacity we are holding right now and the joint research and demonstration center jrdc is under the ministry of water supply so ministry of water supply is the responsible agency for the country to ensure safe secured drinking water supply throughout the day like so in again back i would be so happy to see the pub partners nus partners all the way that all pub nus the sort of like we have in a very strong relation between sri lanka and uh, the national water supply and drainage board the the agency for res responsible agency for supply and drinking water so thank you very much for everyone giving this opportunity to us thank you dr ayoke okay? yes right thank you dr varagoda uh, following this uh, please let us welcome professor shp parakrama karuna ratne Senior Professor and Chair of Zoology, University of Peradeniya, and also Chairman of JRDC, uh, University of Peradeniya uh, Research Committee, Sri Lanka, to share his opening remark. Please, Professor. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and uh, I warmly welcome you all to this uh, webinar series on behalf of the University of Peradeniya. Actually, as it was stated, that uh, university uh, this jrdc or the joint uh, research and demonstrators demonstration center for water technology is uh, located within the university premises university of peradeniya so uh, let me say a few words about university of peradeniya it is in the hill country uh, uh, of sri lanka it's in the middle of the country and it is about it's a uh, it once it was uh, ranked as the 10th most beautiful university in the world so we have about 200 2000 acres between the hantar mountain range and the mahavali river and we have nine faculties so it covers all disciplines and seven are science based science engineering medicine allied health agriculture Uh, veterinary science dental science uh, so all the science based faculties are here and we do lot of research and we are uh, the rank number one university in sri lanka and in the times higher education ranking we are between 400 to 500 in the world rankings uh, so uh, and and um, this is the largest university in sri lanka and all the oldest university as a residential university and we have four post graduate institutes inside the university post graduate institute of agriculture science humanities and social sciences and medical sciences so uh, we have uh, about a 25000 co community both students uh, staff and non academic and academic staff so we are doing lot of uh, research uh, here we have the university research council a lot of research here and our our staff is very they have very well have obtained their phd's from developed countries and we are we, we have a lot of collaborations and you all are welcome to collaborate with us to do water research now we have jrdc and we do lot of work jointly on water technology so uh, so that's it uh, i have to say and I, i hope that thank you very much to the organizers for organizing this and i hope that this is going to be a very very fruitful webinar series thank you very much right uh thank you professor yes uh so we will begin our sharing session next followed by the panel discussion and q and a before we begin i would like to go over a few items so question and comments to today's presentations and topics will be addressed during the panel discussion and q and a session so you can send in questions or comments by typing your questions into the question pane that is found at your zoom window uh, during that session so if there are similar questions you would like to raise or put up uh, you can which is similar that has been put up by others you can click onto the thumbs up uh, to vote for that question 
All right. Next, let me um, introduce Professor M.I.M. Maujud, the chair for the next session and moderator of the panel discussion. Professor Maujud is currently the chair professor at the Department of Agriculture Engineering at Faculty of Agriculture, University of uh, Peridonia, Sri Lanka. So Professor Maujud has over 25 years of research and teaching experiences in wastewater engineering, water pollution control through bioremediation, constructed wetlands and integrated water resources management. Now I would like to hand over the session to Professor Maujud. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lai. Uh, thank you for the kind introductions and good morning and good afternoon to all participants and the panelists. I'm very glad to chair the, this webinar series number one on the water management and treatment. Uh, thank you for giving this opportunity. Uh, thank you, thank for all the organizers for giving me this opportunity. There are many organizations uh, involved in this uh, webinar series. I must thank them for giving this opportunity. Okay, now I am getting into the uh, session. Uh, we have like three key presentation on uh, very important topics uh, from three uh, specialists. So uh, straight away, uh, uh, there is a uh, 15 minutes for each uh, presentations. Uh, uh, First, I would like to invite uh, Dr. S.K. Veragoda. Uh, already he was in the uh, opening remarks. Uh, if I want to introduce Dr. Veragoda, he's my friend and uh, what I can say, he's an academia, he's a researcher, he's a policymaker, he's a practitioner. So what else we can say about him? He's a very niche person on this whole field of uh, water management, right? So it is very good to have him uh, on the first presentation. Uh, Dr. S.K. Veragoda, Director covering up uh, JDRC Sri Lanka, would like to talk on water management and treatment in Sri Lanka. Now it is over to you, Dr. S.K. Veragoda, and uh, Thank you. the presentation will be given 15 minutes. Thank you for the very interesting uh, very uh, introduction about myself. So let me share my... In the meantime... Uh, I think, uh, Professor Maujud, you can see my screen? Yeah, I can see, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, Professor Maujud, for the time being, I'll just switch off my camera and uh, I'll just go through the present. Thank you, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, this is about the water management and treatment in Sri Lanka. So, get the content for the presentation. I will talk about the water environment in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is famous and all the way in the last couple of years, Sri Lanka is counted as the number one uh, tourist destination in the world that because of uh, the water environment in Sri Lanka. So let me get about little about the water management, then the drinking water supply and future targets, water pollution and challenges right now we are facing and research directives to improve drinking water sector. So getting into the water sector in Sri Lanka, in nutshell, Sri Lanka is an island, 21 million of population and 65,000 square, uh, square meter, uh, uh, square kilometer land area. And the highest point is the Mount uh, Pidurudalagala, 2,882 meters. And the Logan's River is River Maha Valley. I'm just sitting in front of the River Maha Valley in a wonderful place located in uh, this, uh, in, within the units of Peradini. And Sri Lanka having 103 river basins and about small to medium scale 30,000 uh, tanks, man-made tanks. And the, the, when you take the whole country area, 4% of the country area is covered by water bodies. So Sri Lanka is blessed with two monsoons and two inter-monsoons. And the highest rainfall is about 5,500, 5.5 meters. And uh, is gone all over the in the middle part of the country. And we basically divide country into two zones and as wet zone and dry zone. So as I said, so Sri Lanka is covered with many lagoons and particular Putlam are the one wonderful places with a lot of biodiversity, very rich environment you can see over there. And the highest waterfall is 263 meter height waterfall. That's the Babarakanda in the central part of the country. 
and very famous one dunginda among the tourist where you can see a lot of water that's coming as a mist all the way so then the power generation we are using uh, almost like 30% of the total power generation using hydropower and waterfalls are one of the sources for that so then we got uh, a lot of uh, natural not 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 that much of natural reservoirs actually we got man made reservoirs especially and again back we have about uh, six rams identified wetlands again back the water environment so then uh, the man made reservoirs so sri lanka having a long history of man made reservoirs almost like 2000 years of history and uh, the uh, like uh, then recently we got uh, several projects for uh, the dam constructions and all so almost all these uh, reservoirs man made reservoirs coming in history are placed in the dry zone that to address the water scarcity and then the mahaveli the longest river has uh, got five dams constructed in somewhere after 1980s to take up the major challenges sharing water in between wet zone and dry zone so this is what the basic water management in sri lanka in nutshell so if i just get a summary so currently we are having about 9000 to 10000 million cubic meter storage capacity but still we are losing about almost like 55000 million cubic meter of water without having a use that's the one of the biggest challenge right now sri lanka is facing so sri lanka thinking in different directions they want to go for uh, trans boundary uh, sharing water between basins like so then they are having lot of other ideas of putting up uh, different thoughts views of increasing this water capacity or going for the uh, the catchment management and so on so so in sri lanka the irrigation water is being managed by the irrigation department and the river mahaveli having its own authority mahaveli authority when it is coming drinking water this is the today focus for us so we are having national water supply and drainage board and department of national committee water supply so this is this both agencies are under the ministry of water supply under the cabinet minister so then we have local authorities who are running some uh, facilities around the country so when it is getting into the water board national water supply and drainage board they got 344 water supply schemes and right now we have basically conventional water treatment so for the time being we are moving towards the very first uh, reverse osmosis desalination treatment facility in the northern province so probably in future there could be more to come so this is uh, of capacity of 24000 cubic meter per day and funded by adb uh, uh, and that is basically that's under the construction stage now other than that we got 334 water supply schemes the largest in colombo is about 5000 500000 cubic meter production per day ambatale we call then going around the scale from coming from uh, like 500000 to uh, 5000 around so it's spread all over the way in the country to cover 42% of the total population right now and in addition 10% of the populations are being covered by uh, 4500 small scale that's the community managed water supply schemes and these all are integrated by the department of national community water supply so then as i said in the introduction the current government has decided to move forward and bring the coverage the safe drinking water coverage through pipe bond water and other the guaranteed water supply systems to bring up that into 100% of the total population by 2025 so this is what the gar national policy so keeping that in mind so government has made this diagram to bring up the water coverage from the current situation to 20 high to get the total population covered as shown here so this is the idea of the government and basically right now we get about 50% pipe bond water almost like 52% maybe so protected domestic wells are covering about 36% and tube wells almost like about 3% so the tube well that what we go for the deep ground water we touching almost like about 100 to 
20 meters, not like many other countries. They go for about 500 to 1,000 meters, but we don't find the drilling capacity and we are trying to improve that up to 100 meters in near future. So this is what the targets in Sri Lanka. So the National Water Supply and Drainage Board trying to put up from 50% to 75% of the total population by 2025. Then the Department of Community Water Supply through the community-based organizations and the domestic systems that the individual household facilities, they're going to get the balance 25%. So this is what the idea for the, uh, the whole coverage. So in figures, we are having almost like 2,000 plus cubic meters treated all the way per day and distributed through the uh, pipe bone network. And we want to increase that by another same amount by 2025. So the number of families that we are targeting and to cover as given and the connection household almost like 2.4 million and hopefully it will be 4.5 million in 2025. So this is the idea and the length of the distribution of pipe borne water in Sri Lanka is about 44,000 kilometers of pipe network and probably another 30,000 plus will be added into the system in 2025. So Sri Lankan government, the water sector in Sri Lanka got very busy because you got another four years to go and we are targeting 30,000 additional kilometers of pipeline within the country. That's a huge challenge as water professionals. So the national, the government facing a lot of challenges to reach this. It's not just finance, not just the skill, uh, technologies, but as well, the water resources and all. So then government has put forward their ideas, mind to bring up a lot of policy level intervention, putting up uh, all the, 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 the ties all the way, all the directions to release the pressure in the water among the water professionals. So this is what that the government is trying to do. So finally, the main target is to bring up properly managed water sheds. That's what the target, because pollution one side you are doing, the other side you are treating. That's nothing that what we have to do. So if you can minimize the pollution at the water source, that is what the major plan. So Sri Lanka do not find so nicely managed urban policies, urban planning. So that's make a lot of troubles when you are trying to see the water supply in the country. So that's we have to keep in mind. So I just thought to bring the water treatment concepts in Sri Lanka, putting up a one single treatment facility. This is more or less the same for the time being, other than the reverse osmosis plan that we are, what we are going to do very first in the country. That's another three years to uh, get the plant in operation. For the time being, we have the treatment facilities with the conventional, you all know. So this is one that uh, I, I got myself involved in central of the country in tourist area. You may have heard about the Lion Rock. So the Lion Rock area is being fed by this particular treatment facility. So we use take, uh, water from uh, a lake or that is diverted from the longest river, Mahaveli River to the dry zone from wet zone and the capacity is 30,000 cubic meter. And intake, we got a one screen that called Johnson, Johnson screen coming from uh, Australia, the opening size with a sort of uh, open, opening size of three millimeter. That's to avoid whatever the floating objects coming into the plant. So then the basic aeration, then the flax mixing chemical ad addition, we are using alum. Then we are going for uh, PACL, polyaluminum chloride, then more or less a couple of cases, we have the pH correction with lime. Then we got the basic sedimentation with lamella clarifiers. In this case, we have the tube settlers. We have the pulsators. We have the pulsar tubes. We have the super pulsators. So these technologies coming from different part of the world is available right now in the country, but these all come in under the conventional water treatment. So if you take, the filtration, of course, we go for the rapid sand filtration, as well as a couple of cases, we find pressure sand filters also. And the rural scale, we find the slow sand filtration and roughing filters as well. But in the urban cities, it's more, like, more or less like getting with the, the rapid sand filtration. So then the treatment 
uh, what treated water is being distributed through the gravity and pumping systems. So, so nowadays we are moving towards this granule activated carbon filters as well. That because we have a challenge of treating the water with relatively high organic agrochemicals. So we are moving towards that DAC granule activated carbon and couple of cases powdered activated carbon as well. So this is the water treatment process available around the country in more or less like the same throughout the way of this all. So if someone asks whether the Sri Lanka having the what say the access, the whole citizens in Sri Lanka having access to safe drinking water. This is the world map just as a sort of uh, are you opener for us to see the water pollution groundwater because Though we are getting 55% of the population are being fed through pipe borne water, still about 45 having the sources from groundwater. So that is what they got the dug wells, they got the tube wells, maybe about 1% to 2% might be relying on the rainwater harvesting. So one could ask a question like this. So this recently, this was published about the groundwater pollution in Sri Lanka. So telling about the nitrate pollution, telling about the fluoride, Telling about the, the like, I mean, the, the coliform that because of the poor management of the septage in certain areas, because we have the domestic uh, uh, managed septage systems, like with the soakage pit and uh, the septic tank system. So, somewhere in Sri Lanka, the groundwater table is being raised up. So, you can't manage the, the, the minimum gap at least between the soakage pit and the groundwater table, especially in the wet, during the wet zone, rainy period, especially in the rainy period. So, that makes troubles to us. So, and Sri Lanka, unfortunately, has been recognized as one of the mostly challenged country by the climate change, adverse impacts. It was ranked as the world's second mostly affected country in the world in 2018. And 19, they have been shifted to six. So still we have a lot of challenges, almost like 1 billion rupees worth agriculture products, US dollars we lost in last decade. So that's the challenge. So this aggravated a lot of things because the survival of the bacteria under elevated temperatures, maybe people moving towards less secured alternative sources. This all bring a lot of challenges to us. And the... That is why the government has taken a decision to put up the JRDC, the Joint Research and Demonstration Center, with a lot of testing capacities to address these all challenges. While we are meeting the water quantity island-wide, so in the meantime, we have to bring up these all professionals in country to meet the water quality challenges. So that is what the, the con concern, consent, and UNESCO Peradene, we are located, and we got a lot of uh, very uh, like uh, renowned professionals who are working in groundwater pollution. And I mean, like there are a lot of studies going around now. So this is about the inorganic pollution. And uh, Sri Lanka is known for uh, one of the cr critical challenge coming with groundwater. We suspect it's getting from groundwater telling us chronic kidney disease. No one knows exact reason, but they, they, they focus around 30 plus hypothesis and 20 about coming from groundwater. And they were focusing arsenic or cadmium. So this is the distribution of arsenic in the country. And luckily we don't find arsenic in the central part of the country, only in the coastal zone. The maximum is recorded as 66 microgram. The WHO says the 10 is the limit for WHO. So then some other uh, uh, concerns like so when you take about the organic pollution, so we know that organic pollution is not known to us so far. And even the natural organics, that might be some challenges, having putting up some challenges. This is one other research getting from JRDC uh, about the, the combination, complexations of organic and inorganic and how that can get through the human body and penetrate into the kidneys, focusing this as a national interested project. So then, about the trihalomethane, because as I said, so trihalomethane is one of the challenges that we find all the way in the treated water, because we are going to the chlorination. Uh, so chlorination all the way, having a chance of reacting with uh, natural organic matter, DOC. So then it may 
come up with a THM that can cause cancer. So this is also that we have another interest and Sri Lanka is putting forward their thoughts, ideas, and especially in the water management, in the distribution systems. If you go for a loan retention, rather than having centralized chlorination, we do think of going with the decentralized chlorination, with the super chlor uh, the booster chlorination. So this is one other that we are trying up here in Sri Lanka. So then country has taken a lot of initiatives to go with organic farming, but still it's a huge challenge. And we find that a couple of cases coming up and this organic pollutants, agrochemicals have been, have been recognized and as like that getting as a, one of the crucial issue in groundwater pollution. So when you are addressing the safe drinking, of course that we have to take up, you have to think of this and you have to address this. Then moving towards the antibiotic resistive bacteria, of course, Sri Lanka had some, some research done about this and we are moving forward to go for further studies because WHO putting up alarms telling that by 2050, 10 million of the people may die because of the antibiotic resistive bacteria. So we have some collaborations with uh, international partners as well. So then moving towards uh, some other uh, thinking about the microplastic. So we are putting up another research here with Japan to bring up with University of Peradeniya, JRDC all together to see how that the microplastic, the availability, the existence of this in our water bodies, water environment. So this is another thought of putting up this all. So on top of that, there are a lot of incidents happening in the country because of unorganized, unplanned uh, activities. And spilling of oil is one of the regular event that we observe. So water management, drinking water supply has been challenged through these all activities, by these all activities. And in regards of addressing this groundwater pollution, we are trying our best to get the best technologies. And we do work with Singapore as well to see how that we can improve the groundwater treatment technologies available in dry zone. So nano filtration has been recognized and introduced recently, and it is well in place. And in addition, when you get the pipe bone water, so the ROO nano might not get as a feasible financial solution for us. So we are moving towards the electrodialysis reversal technology. And we are in the place of uh, the, we are in, in the uh, right, right now, we are trying to put up this EDR as a sort of new technology to treat groundwater in the dry zone. So then on top of that, we are trying to introduce the rainwater innovative techniques for harvesting and spawn city coming from Beijing. China is one of the another application that we have just done some piloting here in the country to address the rainwater harvesting because Sri Lanka having relatively high amount of rainfall throughout the year, even in the dry zone, about one meter to 1.5 meter. If you can manage this well, so probably that would be a good solution for us to address the climate change impacts. So as the last slide, we had a very good project between uh, NUS led by Professor Un. So happy to have Professor today with us, Dr. Layoke and PUB. This brought up Sri Lanka a novel concept of water safety plan. We learned water safety plan from Singapore for the very first time in 2012, 11, and the APN grant. And now Sri Lanka has been recognized as you can see in the map. So that's in uh, the green color, WSP policies or regulations under development. Thank you very much, PUB. Thank you very much, uh, NUS all the professionals for bringing up this opportunity. And we have got almost like 80% of the water supply under the, in the country have, uh, is covered with 11 step of this uh, process, the approach, water safety plan, keeping that as a note. And thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, the, Dr. Veragoda for, for giving, giving a brief introduction on this water management treatment in Sri Lanka, and you have opened up many research areas and ideas. So we will come back to your presentation in the Q&A uh, answer session. So please uh, be there. And also I ask all the participants to raise their questions uh, in the question answer uh, box. Okay, so we will move to the next uh, uh, presentation uh, by Mr. Aik Numpua. He is a chief specialist uh, water treatment, uh, PUB Singapore's National Water Agency. And he is a very good uh, 
uh, excellent uh, experience the how to uh, convert the research output to a practical application. So you are welcome. Uh, we welcome uh, Mr. Aiknum Pua for, for, the, for sharing your thought on water management and treatment in Singapore. So let's welcome Mr. Pua. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Uh, you can see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, we can see your screen. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, a good, very good afternoon to all. And also a thank you to Nuri for the invitations to speak in this forum. All right. My name is Point Nam and I'm from QB. Right. I'll go straight ahead on my presentation. Okay, that's it. So, uh, so I will share with uh, PUB's experience or Singapore experience in water supply management and treatment. Let me start off uh, with an intro to Singapore. Now, as you know, Singapore is a very tiny island state, right? Like uh, that located in the tropics. And like, I think like Sri Lanka, I think we have plenty full of rain. We, in Singapore, actually, we have about averaging 2.2 to 2.4 meters of rain annually. So this is a lot of rains, right? And Singapore shouldn't be short of water. However, you know, in the World Resource Institute 2015 report, right, they, they rank Singapore, it will be the one of the most worst water stress country in the world by 2.40. So it's quite intriguing, right, how it is so. Now, as you know, Singapore has about 5.5 million population and it has to be housed on a land no larger than 725 square kilometer. I thought this is probably what, let's say more 10% of Sri Lankan land size. So it is the lack of land that actually restricted the capacity for Singapore to store the amount of rains that, that, that falls on the land. And uh, despite the management of the reservoir, a lot of the water had to run off into the sea. So we have to, like I said, think of the box solution. How do we then, going into the future, right, continue to secure uh, water supply for the community and also for, for, and, and for economic growth? And this is where uh, we have to think how do we how do we how do we manage the water resources? I want to talk a little bit of history, going back to 19, uh, 20, uh, 208, 2000, uh, 2008, in uh, in the uh, inaugural Singapore National Water Week. We have the honor of our uh, uh, founding father, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who was our first prime minister. Now he made a very a striking uh, statement, and I quote, right? He said, this means water dominated every other policy. Every other policy had to bend at the knee of water survival. Now, this is, I think this is a very powerful uh, uh, statement that provided a very strong political view, right? That on for the whole of government effort to move towards creating a water master's plan, right? That integrated, you know, uh, into the urban planning. And this has to be a joint effort. I also want to quote uh, another of our uh, uh, prominent personnel, right? Professor Tommy Koh. Now, in, in the same conference, right? He also mentioned, right? In order for us to manage it optimally, right? Each government should have only one minister in charge of water, right? In 1963, when POV was formed, it was a statutory board named Public Utility Board, typical of a utility uh, uh, agency that is in charge of coordinating electricity, gas, and water, and was then part under the Ministry of Trade and Industry. So in 2011, 2001, right, PUB was reconstituted and performed as no longer public utility board, 
but actually uh, we call it our Singapore National uh, Water Agency, which is what you know now. And this bring together the so-called consolidation of all water management function under one roof, which is the key uh, solution to our water sustainability. So PB was uh, then reconsidered then. So we have, so PUB now has the capability to manage the entire uh, water loop. So uh, as I shown in the slide here. <clears throat> in other words, PUB now manages not only the water runoff, that means that from the rain, it also collects, treat, supply the community. Then we collect back the water as, as a used water, we call it used water and treat it then, of course, in the normal hydrological cycle, right, it goes back to the sea. So we have, this is, I consider as a first drop of water. I always talk to our, my audience that once PUB is formed, right, every drop of water that fall from the sky belongs to PUB. So we need to think of, that is not enough, as I mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, right, we have limited land. And this is so much we can store. We, in the whole of Singapore uh, catchment, right? it is just like we have one glass of water. I can manage the catchment whatever way I can, right? I, can, I, I, I will only still have that one glass of water of uh, probably 100 ml of water. If the rainfall 200 ml, I still can only collect 100 ml and we have to let go the other 100 ml. So we have to shortcut the whole system as our solution. And this is to collect back, first step, our second drop of water is to collect back all the used water and recycle back to the community and not to the sea. In so doing, right, we are able to take away at least 80% of our, 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 our so-called 20% uh, of the water that is rejected and then recycle them back as well as the, those water that has been used in the community. We estimated that a single drop of water that is recycled, we can recycle that drop of water 20 times before it is dis it disappeared. So this is a this is a this is a good uh, uh, avenue for increasing our water resources. That is one second drop. Now we need to think of is it enough for our future use? The question, the answer is maybe not. So we have to look at where is our third drop of water coming from. And that is from the sea. Singapore is surrounded by the ocean, uh, the sea. So they have plenty of seawater. All we need to do now is to convert seawater to drinking water. And that's where we started desalination. So with these three move, uh, motions, right, we actually effectively close the whole entire water loop that allow us to collect all the fresh water and seawater to treat into drinking water as one in this water and further enhance the, the, the water, increased water by recycling our water. Now, PUB being an agency now control of the entire water loops, all water, all water matter is under the jurisdiction of PUB or the ministry, then we're able to then improve the efficiency of our water system on the, on the system level, right? and control all water quality from source to tap. And that way, we tighten the water security to ensure that all, at all water are adequately filtered, re uh, recycled, and, and for drinking purposes, and also for industry use. So effectively, we are actually able, we are able to achieve our key strategy of we capture every drop, we reuse and water endlessly, and we desalinate the seawater. That would be our main function of our management of our water supply. And effectively, by diversifying this source of water, right, we, we created our four national tap, right, including imported water, the water from catchment, new water and design water. I will talk about important water later. Let me say, go first to the nas first national tap. This is our local catchment and we have about, we have five uh, 
uh, treatment plants that treat water from the local catchment for drinking purposes, right? <clears throat> and that's our first natural tap. The second tap is actually also, to, also service one off, but it's, called, it's imported from our neighbor, Malaysia North, at the North. We have an agreement with the Malaysian government to tap water so that we can bring, send the water down to Singapore. And this agreement actually will expire in 2061. Uh, once that day come, hopefully we will be able to extend. If not, our dependency on the recycling water and seawater will go up, right? And which I will talk about it later on. And this is the uh, second tab. The third tab, of course, is our real, we call it a new water, the recycled water, which uh, advanced processes to treat it into a, uh, a drinking uh, grid, drinking standard. <clears throat> and lastly, of course, our desalination, desalination. Currently, we have already four plants in operation, and the fifth desalination plant will come online uh, this year in 2022. So this is our latest desalination plant that, is, uh, that has started operation. It is called the Marina East Desalination Plant. Now the design of this plant has, has some uniqueness in it. Now it actually incorporated a features that was, that was uh, uh, demonstrated through our research and development uh, uh, effort. We call it the uh, uh, variable uh, salinity plant. That means that this particular desal plant right, has two modes. One mode that you can switch to treat surface water and the other mode switch to seawater. And the intention really is that, as I mentioned just now, we have plenty of rain to a point whereby even after we st store up to the maximum prim of our reservoir, we have to let go the, the fresh water, the, sea, uh, the rain water. Now, the idea of this dual mode desalination plant really is during, during rainy season, right? Excess rainwater will not be discharged into the sea, but will be pumped into a desalination plant like this one and will treat it as a as surface water plant. When in dry weather, as the, as, as the reservoir drops and there's no more rain, right? This plant can switch to a seawater desalination mode and take water from the sea to treat. In this way, we actually manage the cost of our productions. So what I've said all so far, right, is really the hardware of our, our water management uh, system. Uh, what I have not talked about is the hardware or the software part, which I will not go into detail. It actually centered on education, regulation, uh, engagement of our, our, our society to try and conserve water. So these two functions, hardware and, and hardware and hardware, actually combine to form the whole principle of our, 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 ideology, our ideology of water management for Singapore. Right? So I said enough for the water management part. Let me now touch on the water treatment part. <clears throat> I put down word treatment, but I have also entered a word leverage technology. As I mentioned, as I go through the slide, I will put a lot of emphasis on the, uh, the leveraging on technology. How do we go in selection of technology that will best fit the condition in which Singapore is applying those technology, right? <clears throat> as mentioned, I think uh, uh, earlier, typically, I think, we started off with a conventional treatment plant that consists of the, the flocculation, coagulation and flocculation, sedimentation, sand filtration, and chlorine disinfection, disinfection, right? So this has been working well for us for many years now. Climate change has, has a lot of impacts on the way in which now we manage our water treatment plant. Now, as the climate change impacts growth, I think recent, in recent years, uh, Singapore is seeing uh, more frequent uh, droughts and more frequent uh, uh, extreme rainfall, resulting in, in, in uh, 
as you see in the two, two photographs there, uh, we have droughts in 2019 that uh, one of our pond in the Botanic Garden almost dry up. And, uh, in, and most recently in August 2021, no, uh, our, one of our major roads you know, in, uh, in Singapore, Pukitima roads, right, the, 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 the heavy rainfall causes the overflow of the canal, causing a, a flood in the road, as you can see here. Now, these phenomena will have impacts on the water quality. In our, in our reservoir, we are seeing changes in the, in, in the dominant species, different dominant species of algae, right, that actually produces the taste and odor issues. We are also seeing changes in the seawaters that actually causes, uh, during, uh, there are many different what, nip tides that causes a high interbidity uh, and chlorophyll A changes. And likewise, whatever happened here, the water that you use right, will eventually impact the new water or the recycled water, whereby the, the, the rate of fouling, the pot fouling potential uh, 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 increase in our membrane. So this has to be taken into consideration you know, as, as we see changes in our environment and whether or not right, our current treatment plant can, we, can be able to handle, like uh, I said, in the whole water uh, so-called uh, loop, water treatment plant is the final barrier you know, to protect the water, the, the water, the drinking water, that is sent to the consumer. So it's very critical for us to understand you know, the changes in downstream of the of, of the water of the water treatment plant, right? Where we are able, well, we have instituted policy and changes and technology, you know, incorporate technology to, to, to mitigate the pollution in the catchment, right? And maintain and try to maintain the quality. But this we can only sow too much. There's still, we can still see elevation. That means that the quality of our soil water are creeping up day by day. You know, over the years, you know, our TOC, the total, total organic carbons in, in, in reservoir, from a level of two, it has risen to sometimes nine, sometimes even 10 or 12. You know? Now, this has, in, this, has con, this has created concern you now, whether or not the, the current existing treatment uh, schematic you no know, at the conventional treatment stream is able to handle no it doesn't so we have to think about how do we then upgrade existing infrastructure right to be able to handle the quality of the, the quality of the source water that is coming in so over the last 10 years all our treatments are undergoing great uh, upgrading you know, where the plants are newer, they will do upgrading. Where plants are older, we are actually going into total renewal. Now, as an example of upgrading, right, this is a plant that in Chua Chukang, whereby we are actually tightening up our separation technology from sand filters to membrane. We have, uh, we have uh, immersed membrane, whereby we do retrofitting. We have to retrofit in the existing plant because some of the infrastructures are still usable, that means they have not reached their useful lifespan. We have to look at upgrading, where if you look at the lower phase two of this plant, we have land, we can open up new land to incorporate new technology, right? We also have to look at the disinfection process, you no? Know? Is chlorine, like the uh, chlorine disinfection uh, the, still the better way to do it? As you know that as the organics rises in, in, in numbers, right? it formed the precursor for THM in the drinking water. So we need to change, to look at a more efficient way of disinfection. So we have chosen ozone. And coupled with ozone, right, we need to introduce new process, right, to take away the, the assimilar organic carbons that, that are oxidized as the, as the DOC got uh, passed to the oxidation stage and turn into a biodegradable organic carbon and turn into a food for system. So we have introduced a biological added carbon or, or, G, or, or GAC carbon filters, right? To absorb or to consume uh, the, the, uh, <coughs> the, the carbon, the biodegradable carbons, right? 
to prevent it from entering the system that become a food for bacteria regrowth in the system. So these are the changes that has been going on in our treatment plan. And by the next five years, all our treatment will be employed, will be deployed with uh, membranes, filtration, ozone and PAC combined uh, system. Okay. So this is one example of the, of the retrofittings that I mentioned about. We have an existing uh, plant that each that, that is using sand filter, and we have to remove the sand from the filter and convert it into a submerged membrane. In these ways, we are we try to reduce the cost of introducing new technology, but rather incorporate new technology into existing plant. Here is a green field site whereby we have the opportunity to deploy the most latest technology, right? That, that, that can provide the, the optimum efficiency in, uh, in, in our water treatment plant. Here we are, I'm showing you is the ceramic membrane that, uh, uh, that, that has been built at our, at our CCK plant. It's a 40 MGT or uh, <clears throat> uh, 80, 82,000. 80, 82,000 uh, 82, uh, cubic meters per, uh, per day is done. Now, this particular technology is selected not because straight from the market, but rather we spent about 10 years going through a research and development process of piloting and demonstration with our collaborators to validate the performance of the technology before we actually implement and build a large scale. And this is the result of a 10 year uh, research and development efforts, right? That we decided that we go on full scale on this plant. And, and it has, and the ceramic has been proven to be more robust and it actually are able to deal with very aggressive, a very uh, uh, aggressive water with high TOC. For example, I think uh, uh, even our uh, polymeric membrane, right? It has it has a limitation on the on on the DOC level. Once the organic passes a certain level, right, you actually foul the membrane. But in case of in of ceramic membrane, it can actually withstand a high input of organics, right, and yet we can treat it with uh, without any uh, any problem. So this the this is this is the advantage of the ceramic. So you can see the upgrading has uh, in the plants. They incorporate all this technology. Uh, switching to ozone, replacing chlorine uh, disinfection. Now here is a slide that actually try to demonstrate the upgrading whereby we adopt new technologies that improve, will improve the performance that help us to minimize our footprint. As you know, Singapore is tiny. Every inch of our lands are precious. So we are also looking at technology that really have a small footprint. Now, in this case here, you will, in the left of the picture, you will see the ozonator that we had, right? It is a 12 such generator, which is a huge generators, right? That, uh, that produce that uh, uh, for, uh, for a 362,000 kilometers uh, so-called uh, plant. On the right-hand side, you can see that all these 12 uh, has been replaced by just three tiny uh, generators that occupy no, uh, 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 probably a tenth of the room that is originally, originally occupied by the old generator. So this is to, to illustrate the adoption of technology, not only uh, in uh, advanced, but also look at technology that are able to, to provide the, the same efficiency with a smaller footprint, right? This slide that we have also uh, built a BAC filters. Uh, and this is, uh, like I said again, it is an additional process that added into our, co our conventional treatment process, right? To actually provide the capacity or capability, right? To mop up the, 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 uh, the organics that, is, that will cause uh, regrowth in the system and, and, and render the water more stable in the network. So as I said, leveraging of technology is an important uh, effort in PUB. 
right? So how do we do it? You know? Looking ahead, if you look at Singapore demand, Singapore water demand currently is at 2 million cubic meters per day. We estimated by 2060, right? That demand will grow to 4 million cubic meter a day. Now, as I said, as far as the land storage is concerned, there's no more space for a store. And we have to rely more on our recycling and desal plant to provide that additional capacity. Right? To do that at current cost of energy, right, it will be astronomically expensive. So if we were to do nothing and continue our current practice of desalination and recycling, and when we reach 260 or right, that, that water cost will be 10 times more, maybe more. So our long-term goal really is we have to look for technology that is able to provide us the capacity in two years, six years, but still at the cost of current energy and also at current footprint. This is a challenge that we have to achieve, achieve by 2060. So we have to form, we have to come up with a plan, and that is to invest in RD. Right. As we move towards the future, right, it is not easy for us to go to the market and off the shelf and pick up the technology and say, this is going to do because different country and different requirements. So manufacturers do not make, uh, tailor make a certain technology just for you. And POB realized that and we need to drive certain technology that is going to fit our needs. And I call it fit for purpose. And that is where the, the government's effort has chipped in, right? the National Research Foundation of Singapore, right? to push on the R&D investment under the water sector. We started this way back in 2022. And up to today, we have actually done 661 project, project in two, uh, 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 and spent $700 million of uh, investment. Right to create this up. So what I said earlier in terms of the BAC filter, ceramic maintenance is part of the outcome. The the the, the variable desalinity plant is also part of this effort. Right, and we have a roadmap that actually encompasses all all categories of technology that included the drinking water segment, but it also includes like you see coastal protections, water quality, management of our network, the used water network, the drinking water network as well. So this actually, uh, this roadmap forms the footprint right, for us to, to, to drive the technology, the, the technology that we require in the different path. And I say, we have to now drive in order to achieve the capacity in 2060 at the current price, right? We need to drive the energy cost price, energy cost of water from the current of 2.53, uh, uh, two actually now it's two kilowatt, eventually hoping near to one kilowatt. And likewise, we, we recycling, you know, we need to drive uh, the energy down so that we could be at less than, probably hopefully less than 0.1 kilowatts. And we have we are doing uh, projects that perhaps you know can combine uh, uh, like uh, you can see here MBR we are introducing MBR so that we are combining three process into one process. So these are the efforts that are currently in ongoing, right? And then of course having done all this, when you introduce this at the system level, right? With all the advanced technology that we employ, right? These are not uh, easy process that we can just manually handle. We have come to a stage whereby every process, right, like the membranes, right, it is fully automated. But if you put every process together, 10 processes in one basket, and each of them have their own automated system, right, at the system level, they will not be able to run optimally. 
So we have to go into what I call a full automation uh, control of the system at system level. Digitization is one way, right, to have to have a full control of a system at the system level to manage the process independently and as a core as a uh, and and as a as a single system. So a lot of a lot of research are going into digitalization as well. And, and that comes up with our good map that image the, the water loop, but we have what I call a smart QD loop map. So I'm going to give a few examples of, uh, of the things that we are doing now. AOP piloting, uh, we, currently we do not use AOP at the moment, but it is not, something that we will not be using. It probably will be using it if the, if, we, if the control in the water quality from the source, right, continue to deteriorate, deteriorate. then they may, there may be times that we will need to introduce additional process such as AOP. So instead of waiting until the time, we are actually planning ahead. So we are doing research demonstration and research work to actually come up with a drawer, I call it a drawer plans, so that we can size up the definite, the dimension and also the specification of an AOP process, right? And, 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 and work out the, the land size. So in all our new plants, like our new uh, recycling plant, spaces are allocated for AOP. In the event that in the future, 10 years, 15 years down the road, right? If this process is needed, right? We already designed to plug in such a process into the existing plan. So the existing plan will be designed to be coupled with the AOP where the time needed, right? We are also looking at different uh, membranes, you know, membranes that are able to do much more uh, efficiently than the current system, uh, current membrane, and I think later on probably Prof Wu would, would talk a little bit about the uh, the work that NUS is doing. That is working with PUB, so I won't go too much into this. So we are also looking in membrane material, the cons the membrane constructions, right? A ceramic membrane already successfully tested in the drinking water. So we are also looking into ceramic membrane application in diesel water. As you see on the top of the, of the schematic, I've drawn a, a, uh, uh, a coupling of two process, you know, uh, DAF and the ultra uh, filtration. There is a possibility that if this is successful, right, we probably have, we can do away with the two process and just combine them into one process. Again, that will help to save energy and, and also uh, in, in, in this process that, that is, we are driving to lowering the energy, right? Closed circuit reverse osmosis is another uh, uh, technology we are exploiting to help us to improve our energy in the diesel plant. So again, here you can see that we, are, we have been working on this for some time and it has been coming up with quite promising results. And the next step is that we'll be coupling this into a, what I call a, uh, I call it IVP, you know, it's, it, it is a, a demonstration plan that, that we will couple, that we couple all the technologies that we have tested, right, into a single uh, system and then we'll validate the number from the piloting that we've gotten, right. Again, there's another membrane-based, uh, echoporid-based uh, membrane that we are exploring. Right? And you can see on the graph that uh, the difference between the current commercial, the energy use, you know, between the AO, uh, from the echoporid-based membrane. So there's some, there, so these are, these are what I've said, it's our water, water treatment base. There are others, uh, technology, like I said, we have, on 661 projects, you know. so among those, some, of, uh, some are listed here as well. So we've done a project like uh, monitoring, uh, water quality monitoring, as, uh, and, and, and in the used water site, we even going into a GPS uh, 
uh, less uh, GPS less environment, flying a drone into a into a deep water pipe tunnels to 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 inspect the tunnel. So these are these are the various uh, projects that currently POVs are doing, and these are some of the few which I want to highlight you know, uh, to you. All right. <clears throat> so I'd like to touch a little bit on the ecosystem. Now I can see here, Singapore is a very small country. You know, as we as as we push research work, you know, maybe I best that if I analyze uh, uh, like do an analogy. You know, in a Toyota, let's say take a car part company, a Toyota, the Toyota company design a car. So when they want to produce this car, right? They are dependent of hundreds or thousands of a small and medium-sized company that produce all the parts for them to put together. And they need an integrator to put the part together so that to form the big, uh, the actual car that it can drive on the road. While the car is driving on the road, you need a, uh, a workshops, mechanical workshop, right, to help maintain the car. So water treatment plant is like having a car, you know. As we build up our water system, water plant, a water plant uh, uh, system, right? We need to have an e uh, ecosystem of industry that can support the plant, right? In terms of providing new technology, right? Integrating the technology and also support industry to support the operation of the plant. And this is an efforts that uh, work together that the Singapore government are on a top-down basis, right? The, the Economic Development Board, you know, you have the National uh, Nas uh, NRF, the National Research Foundation and PUB. We all work together to build an ecosystem that can be able to support the water, the water industry, right? Uh, and uh, the, so here you see here that over the year, we built up that ecosystem with overseas partner, with local startup, and so on. And this is critical for the health of the water industry and also for the, the efficient and, and cost economy operation of our water treatment plant. Right? Of course, we need skilled workers. Having built up the, the, that ecosystem, the ecosystem has to be the staffed by skilled worker. And we pitch in, not, uh, we're not counting NUS and NT and all this. Uh, Singapore also pitch in you know, to build uh, 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 avenue for startup to, to, to set up the company and also a, a training center, right? To train you know, uh, our water, our Singapore Water Management uh, uh, Water Academy actually conducted courses, right? To, to, to our own POV staff and as well as the industry. So the, the next, re next uh, course that is coming is water reuse. And I know it's, uh, this Ian Law, uh, one of our partner from Australia, who is very experienced in water reuse. I think he will be teaching on this one. So uh, from 11 to 14 April, this is one, one another efforts in terms of the overall uh, so-called management system that we're trying to build in to incorporate the training part as well, right? And lastly, before I end, right, is how do we interact? And then in the Singapore International Water Week is one uh, avenue whereby we're able to bring everybody together. And through this interconnection, uh, inter uh, context, right, it will help to foster the overall, overall uh, wellness and health of the ecosystem that we're trying to put in, right? So I think this is my last slide and the, uh, and the National International Water Week is happening also in April and we are trying to do it as a physical meeting and hope that you know, uh, all of you will be able to attend, right? So all I've said here is just a snippet of what is already written in, a, in our publication. I've actually listed out recommended three publications uh, published by POV. But a lot of the information in our in our you know research innovation and the way we operate uh, the, the water trim plant or our water management system are all listed out here. So I, I you can actually go and download the 
uh, this uh, publication and you can and it, it will explain in much greater detail that I've done so. So I think this is end of my talk and I'll thank you very much. I'll take questions later on. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Pua for sharing the whole uh, the experience in within a, a couple of minutes. Uh, so it's a wonderful presentation. Uh, I, I very much like the terminology used to hard and uh, hardware. So you were able to uh, convince us uh, on this hard and hardware through your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pua. I think we will uh, continue, your discuss, uh, continue your sharing with the discussion. Many questions uh, to Dr. Veragode and uh, Mr. Pua and uh, also question to Professor Hu. So I, I saw that uh, Dr. Veragoda was uh, answering the questions. Uh, uh, yeah, I will move to the, uh, uh, Mr. Pua and I will come back to Dr. Veragoda later if we have a time. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Pua, there was a question uh, uh, that's in Singapore. They use a 50% of the uh, rainfall collection and the rest is going to the sea. But uh, the, the, the strategy is uh, the use uh, uh, used water for recycling. So the question is, uh, uh, is there any opportunity uh, cost for uh, recycling the used water or uh, the recycling the, the rainwater that is we let it to go to sea? What is your uh, experience? Or, thinking on this one. Mr. Pua, you got- Okay, got let, me, let me explain. I think, uh, uh, correct it, I think when I said, uh, use the analogy of the, of the glass, right? Uh, full and then uh, it's not 50-50, it's, it's definitely less than 50% that is lost to the sea. It varies, you know, from time to time, it could be 10% to 20%. Uh, I don't have the exact number. But we do have, when heavy downfall, we have to let go some water. Now, to his answer to the questions, why not we build, uh, instead of treating the used water, recycling it, why not we catch the excess water, excess rain? The question is, as I said, we already use up all the land that is possible for building storage. Now, whatever excess rain, there's no way for collection anymore. That is the max. That's why I use the glass as an analogy. It's already full. Any excess, right? You pour in the same glass, right? It will still overflow. I have, do not have a second glass. However, right, in our whole water site, whole water system, we do have we need to collect all the used water, right? And we also need to treat those users before we can throw it into the sea. So this is a natural hydrological cycle. So what I mentioned in my uh, loop is that we can short circuit that whatever water that has been treated to be thrown into the sea, I can draw it out and into a plant immediately. That means that it's a real time. We are talking about real time. There's no storage. Whatever the, the wastewater from plant produces, right? We extract out from the, from, 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 from the effluence uh, pipe and go straight into a Re recycling plant and produce the water straight into the distribution system. So there's no storage and that is how we could do it. Otherwise, note that if you, otherwise we need, will need storage and that is something we cannot do. I hope, yeah, I hope that I answer yeah, the question. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pua. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we'll, there are some few more questions. I will come back to uh, Mr. Pua. Uh, Professor Hu, there, are, there is a one question. Uh, in this uh, removal of micropollutan using UV AOP, the organic matter presence would be uh, 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 hindering. So how do you deal with that one? Okay, um, I saw this question coming from Elling, our friend also. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's a small word. Okay, definitely, this, this is a very nice question. I think anybody doing this, uh, you know, AOP process realize that. 
the organic matter's presence, the natural organic matter, you know, uh, is going to impact on our downstream AOP process. So no doubt on that, actually, we have, uh, in, uh, you know, negative impact. So, uh, you know, to, to enhance your AOP process, uh, our suggestion is uh, you need to have a certain pretreatment okay, to somehow control the impact of uh, uh, natural organic matter. So that I think uh, when when it moves to the downstream, then you have uh, much less uh, impact given by nature organic matter. So, and bearing in mind the UA, UV AOP or other AOP processes, uh, they are, uh, you know, energy intensive, and uh, you don't want to use this energy for some other, you know, organic matter like nature organic matter that much, and you want to deal with those emerging organic contaminants. So the nature organic matter need to be somehow uh, taken out or reduced to a large extent before it comes to your AOP process. That probably is the, the way to go. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Hu. And then I'll move to uh, uh, Mr. Pua. There is a question from uh, 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 Sri Lanka. Uh, what is the Singapore experience to reduce the per capita water consumption? OK, I thought I answered that. <laughs> OK, the, um, the per capita. This is more on this is more on the hardware which I didn't go into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hardware. Yeah. Yeah, we want to listen from. Yeah. You. <laughs> so actually, this is this is a, a few 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 effort really from the regulatory ends. We actually mandated you no know, the use of water saving devices, you no know, and low low water use like the water system. Uh, we have limit the volume like fourteen liter or one point four liter. Then we we also develop jointly with uh, uh, technology provider shower head, you no know, special shower heads, uh, that actually tells the develop tell the users right whether they are overusing the water or not using water. On the more broader way, smart water. Now smart water is uh, is is beyond uh, AMR. It is a device that not only registered automatically the reading, but also monitor the behavior of the consumer in the household. They will know how much water he's using for washing at what time, whether that, and also on top of that, it also monitor whether there is excessive usage and whether this excessive is, is normal. If it's normal, that means that they will send out a message to say there's a leak, there may be a leak in the system. So with all this effort, including education, we do a lot of education to talk about how people can save water. So through this, right, we are, we, that is the effort for reducing the per capita income. I think currently we are at uh, uh, 2,400, 2, is it? I can't remember the actual little because I'm not in the hardware part. So these are all the efforts that, that we do you know, in reducing per capita consumption. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Pu yeah, Mr. Pua, that uh, very interesting. Uh, I have one question to, I mean, that's my question to Professor Hu. Uh, well, uh, yeah, we understood that uh, uh, one solution become a problem. Uh, we try to solve a, a problem in the sanitary, in the sanitization, and that become a, a problem in the, in the wastewater treatment. So these problems, solution and the problems, these uh, loops are going ahead. So what is your uh, opinion, uh, Professor Hu, on this uh, regard? One solution lead to another problem. So are we going to continue with this? Or what is your uh, uh, thought of it? So thank you, Professor Maju, right? Uh, I mean, the, the solution I, I just now propose is one kind of a solution. There could be some other solution as well. But um, any solution is not going to be per perfect. You just look at this AOP process, it can be very, very efficient, can be highly, highly uh, effective. You can get 90%, 95 even more than that uh, in terms of removal or inactivation. But don't forget about energy consumption in this particular process. So uh, it's, as you said, you know, one, one solution needs to another problem. So uh, energy is uh, one key uh, issue, you know, for people in this AOP process field, you know, we, we are uh, actively looking into that. And there's a possibility to lower down the energy, right? If we make use of the sunlight instead of UV light, or if we make use of some other newer 
uh, type of the UV sources, like uh, just now I mentioned about UV LED. I don't have much time to touch on it, but we actually already started looking into LED process uh, involved in the in a small scale, even medium scale water treatment uh, process, you know, to lower down the energy consumption in this particular process. So, so I think you are right. I think we 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 are definitely gotten some issues associated with our solution. But I think the water industry and the water professional uh, people are working very hard to, to address those. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for that uh, inspiring uh, answers. Yeah, there is another questions to all panelists. Uh, even the participant also can can answer the capacity uh, deionization CDI technology for. Uh, treating water. A a anything you, you any uh, panelist can uh, share the experience on these CDI technologies. Uh, PUB side actually has done some work on this capacity deionized uh, technology on the membrane. Uh, so far, I am not too sure. Of course, I am not I am not involved in this particular uh, technology, right? Uh, we have not have too much success in the during our research work. Perhaps somebody have better success. Okay, all right. Uh, others, uh, yeah. I see. Jocelyn okay. see want to answer, right? Okay, so Jocelyn. Maybe to just finish off uh, with uh, the remaining question here. Yes, yeah, uh, because yeah. we are running over time already. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, what? yeah. Okay, right. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, there were some more questions uh, due to the time limitations. Uh, uh, we are very sorry. And there were questions that panelists already have answered. And, uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for giving this wonderful uh, uh, exercise uh, on this uh, wastewater treatment and the management, uh, the sharing the experience between these two S, Singapore and Sri Lanka. So thank you very much for all the participants uh, actively. You contributed a lot in this discussion. Now the floor is uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Lai. Thank yeah. you, Dai. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Maujud, and thank you uh, for all the speakers and panel members for this afternoon uh, session. Yeah, so we have come to an end for today's webinar. So I hope uh, that you have had a wonderful session. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the next webinar. Uh, do keep uh, this, uh, you can scan the QR code and bookmark the web page here where we put our full program. We will be putting up uh, further webinars that we have on this page as well. And we will keep you informed of our next uh, and up and coming webinar soon. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.